Yo, what's cooking, movie mavens? Buckle up for our weekly movie madness roundup. Let's dive into the correct opinion. So, our first headline for this week is going to be about Marvel's Thunderbolts. That's right, hold on to your capes, Marvel fans. Thunderbolts might have just found their thunder in Lewis Pullman. Yes. Lewis Pullman, the man with a last name that sounds like a superhero secret weapon, has been quietly conquering Hollywood with his charm and talent. Son of the legendary Bill Pullman, he's more than just his dad's shadow. He's the silver screen's stealthy sensation. From the high-flying skies of Top Gun Maverick to the thunderous battlegrounds of Thunderbolts, Holman's versatility knows no bounds. With a smile that could light up Times Square and a knack for stealing scenes faster than a sneaky cat burglar, Holman's career is like a roller coaster ride. You never know which twist or turn he'll take next. With his talent and charisma, Holman could electrify the silver screen like never before. Replacing Steven Yeun? <laughs> That's a tall order. But let's face it Thunderbolts needs a jolt, and Pullman might just be the spark they're looking for. Which brings us to our next marvelous update about the Fantastic Four. So, is the Fantastic Four heading back to the editing room? Maybe. The rumors are that Marvel's not pulling any punches on the Fantastic Four, pushing for another rewrite and another chance at greatness. Kudos to Kevin Feige for catching this one before it started filming. That's what I call superhero vigilance. Rewrites can be a blessing in disguise, folks. Here's hoping this third attempt at bringing Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four, truly living up to its name. Sticking with the House of Ideas, our next rumor involves one John David Washington. As Kang? Talk about a time travel and twist. The MCU's casting game just got a whole lot more exciting. Jonathan Majors' exit might have left us reeling, but the Washingtons stepping in? That's blockbuster news. Can you imagine John David Washington as a younger version with Denzel Washington as Kang's older self? Talk about a generational showdown. The family that conquers time together stays together. John David Washington is the man with the DNA for drama and the chops to match. From infiltrating the KKK to navigating the mind-bending world of Tenet, Washington's career is a mixtape of intensity and intrigue, with each role adding a new layer to his cinematic swagger. As the heir to Denzel's throne, he's not just riding on his father's coattails, He's carving out his own path through Tinseltown's jungle. With charisma that could charm a snake and a smile that could light up Broadway, Washington is the leading man we didn't know we needed until he showed up and stole the show. So hey, MCU, let's make this Kang saga a family affair. Washington, you got our vote for the time traveling throne. Moving along to our next update, we have news about Jennifer Lopez. J-Lo's building her empire one brick at a time, and Bob the Builder's getting a Latino twist. Bronx power activate. Jennifer Lopez is known as the queen of multitasking and also the reigning Latina diva of our hearts. From Selena to Hustlers, J-Lo has twirled through genres like a seasoned salsa dancer, leaving us all in awe of her talent and killer abs. She's not just an entertainer. She's a lifestyle guru, a fashion icon, and the reason women across the world attempted the green Versace dress for Halloween at least once. With more hits than a pinata at a birthday party and more sass than a New York cab driver, Lopez is the epitome of Latina excellence, proving that age is just a number when you've got the moves and the attitude to match. JLo's taking us on a construction adventure and she's bringing Anthony Ramos along for the adventure. I can't wait to see what she builds with this project. Here's to more booty shaking and box office breaking moments from our favorite triple threat. Construction hats off to you, Jennifer. 
Which brings us to our last topic, which is all about The Last of Us. Hold on to your apocalypse survival gear because The Last of Us Season 2 just hit the jackpot with its directorial dream team. With Mark Mylod fresh from rep whipping up culinary thrills in the menu, Kate Heron, the Loki whisperer herself, and Stephen Williams, the mastermind behind some of Watchmen's most mind-bending moments, this lineup is hotter than a Molotov cocktail in a zombie horde. And let's not forget Nina Lopez Corrado, whose directing prowess is so legendary, she could make a post-apocalyptic dumpster fire look like a renaissance painting. With this squad at the helm, get ready for more heart-wrenching drama, spine-tingling suspense, and enough plot twists to make your head spin faster than a click of screech. Talk about leveling up, let the storytelling commence. Grab your tissue folks, season 2 is going to be a roller coaster of emotions. Get those popcorn buckets ready. And that brings us into our review of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, heed the warning. Let's get into the underdogs. Yo, what's good movie lovers? Welcome back to the movie blog where I dissect films with a side of bad dad humor and LOLs. Today we're diving into the world of the underdogs and yo gang, my gang. jesus is out here doing big things so put your jerseys on get lit and get ready to sit with uncle snoop in this la based comedy the movie opens up with a warning and yo pay attention to this warning because this warning right here is trying to let you know that if you are not the type of motherfucking person who wants to watch a motherfucking r-rated movie with a lot of motherfucking cursing then you may want to think twice about proceeding because this movie right here <laughs> you've been warned this movie cuts so much it would make sam jackson blush and that's just the tip of the spear so i can't wait to get into this movie with you and then dive into my score for the movie and after i have a special surprise for those of you who stick around after the review so like subscribe and let's get started the movie opens up with what i guess is a flashback to california high school state championship game in 1997 we see George Lopez as the coach to this football game where this high school kid named Jason Jennings makes an incredible catch and wins the Heisman Trophy and goes on to have an incredible career in the NFL. And more, more than that, he goes on to have so much success earning endorsements and more. This young football player is shown to go through a bad streak then in the NFL and has a lot of drama when he's shown to have a lot of issues with people and his teammates and it usually resulted in him being traded from team to team and never actually getting to the point where he won a championship we then find out that this young superstar football player is actually snoop dogg in his youth that was snoop yo they got elias ferguson to play a young version of snoop like yo this had me so confused because it felt so awkward like i was laughing but that was because of how these two don't even look alike so it's like is that how snoop sees himself or saw himself i'm going to tell y'all right now when they make a movie about me i want to make sure that i'm played by a young heartthrob too i don't care if they look like me or not just do what i asked we didn't see that 2Js is living the life with this incredibly opulent house with images and statues and stained glass windows and Wheaties with his face all over everything all throughout every inch of the place. We see 2J sitting down eating Wheaties and of course his box it's his box it's his version of the Wheaties and he starts doing some waking hate like he just gets mad that people aren't praising him the way he thinks that they should for his football career and he starts getting on his podcast and talking to people in the comments and just going off and he wants to be awarded a podcast on television you know just because he's great anyway he goes and harasses his agent or whatever who is ducking him this is played by cal penn and mainly this dude is just downright annoying the hell out of his agent when his agent just explains that people don't want to work with him and like he's just too annoying he's just too vulgar he's just too abrasive and he's just hard to work with it makes it hard for opportunities to come to him if you're just angry and confrontational all the time ha <sighs> anyway 
he just doesn't want to hear what his manager is trying to tell him tries to leave his agent's office pulls out of the driveway in his expensive lamborghini or whatever and he's a whoa he's immediately hit by a big old bus to the point where i was really sitting here wondering if two j's might have just died and faked this all out but he did and instead he somehow ends up in court for the whole thing and he sends to community service that he somehow convinces the court to allow him to complete by coaching a little league football team and the movie just goes from there it's anything but a seamless transition anyways like i said snoop dogg is the main character and that took me a while and i found myself stuck on stupid just trying to let that sink in like i guess the movie is kind of honest about the fact that snoop is the main character but y'all can't really fault me or blame me for expecting movie marketing to be dishonest right like i'm not the only one who suspected the fake out with the real star being some young unknown actor with snoop appearing here and there throughout the movie and of course all over the movie's posters right anyway yeah snoop is the main character and He's playing, like I said, Jason 2J Jennings, a washed up ex-football player who has hit rock bottom. But the defining trait of 2Js is the fact that he's so self-absorbed and vain and selfish and all other variations of that type of behavior in which you only value the opinion, thoughts and concerns of yourself over all others. You know, a narcissist. And then my guy swears like a sailor, as my mama used to say, he just lets him fly to any and every man, woman, or child, and is downright aggressive with it. It's so f***ing annoying because I know people like that. I thought Mike Epps was cool in this movie. He plays this character named Kareem, who seems real familiar, if you know what I mean. Like, he reminds me of someone I thought I saw last Friday. He's definitely bringing those familiar day day vibes to this role as Kareem but he's also sprinkling in some of that smoky up in that performance too and it's like Kareem is smoky and day day all rolled in one this might be Snoop Dogg's best movie performance like I'm not saying that Snoop is the worst but he's definitely benefiting from the people around him to make him look better Sadly, Snoop and Mike Epps are hit or miss with the chemistry in this movie. Crazy thing though, Snoop and Mike seem like they have way better chemistry during the weed smoking scenes. Funny how that works out. And they're funnier together too in those moments. Kareem and his gun, OMG, if you don't just put that damn thing away. Oh, Snoop and Tika Sumter's Sharice have better chemistry and she also can do comedy and show some good comedic timing in the movie. The story is just stupid. Not the plot because the plot is both derivative and generic, but the actual story and execution is dumb. But the co-stars and the supporting cast have great comedic timing and are downright funny as helping to carry this movie. I do at least appreciate that Snoop's 2Js is written consistently throughout the movie and you can easily follow along with his elementary level character arc. Like everything 2Js does is motivated by vanity, selfish, anger, and aggression. Man, this dude need therapy. I have some serious theories on the similarities between 2Js and a specific athlete or two. I'm curious if any of y'all do as well. If you do, let me know what athlete you think in the comments so we can see if we both came up with the same answer. The underdogs tries to be so stupid that it's good and it goes the route of using comedy to achieve that goal with inconsistent results. I do have some concerns of some of the nicknames on the kids' football jerseys. <laughs> Fruit Loop, Chicken Little, Headache, Titties. Well, <laughs> okay, everyone loves titties. The movie follows the blueprint when it comes to those reluctant sports coach movies. I mean, it kind of is in its own loped out way, a modern little giants. I, I'm taught. <laughs> 
Yo, I'm torn, yeah, for real. Like, my inner ratchet self wants to love this movie, but my adult, mature, responsible, and more importantly, socially aware self is struggling. But my gosh, do I love that ratchet ass anthem that they come out to at halftime. Little bitch ass, punk ass bitch. Little bitch ass, punk ass bitch. <laughs> and yo, and what's with the American flag waving, aggressive, heads on spikes? football team that prays and stuff like what was up with that the american flag uh. <laughs> yo i i i don't i don't know yeah i don't know what am i gonna do let's <laughs> go this way <sighs> all right i guess i gotta do it i'm gonna have to give the underdogs a five out of ten i have to that's it but yo, that's all I have for, wait, what? Y'all still here? Y'all ready for the surprise at the end? I got you, fam. And last, but certainly. And like I said, there was a warning with that movie. So let's move on after the review. We've got one more thing. Certain, last, but certainly not least, let's revisit a TMB classic with our interview of Hollywood Darling and Academy Award Best Actor nominee, Coleman Domingo. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today, we're absolutely thrilled to be talking to the brothers of the newly imagined Color Purple. We have Corey Hawkin and we have Coleman Domingo. We also have African members, Anthony White from New York, Hey, Anthony White from New York City. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, the Color Purple. You are both portraying such iconic characters from this beloved story with Mr. and Harpo, right? And now you're rubbing elbows with Steven Spielberg and Oprah Winfrey. So I'm curious, how has this movie changed you as an artist, as an actor, as a performer, as a person, if it's changed you at all? I think I'm still in process to see how it's changing. Because I think that we did the work and work that we think is meaningful. And yes, we're working with people who are the best in the business. And they, the, the film is about being in service to our humanity in many ways and about our families and bringing us together and finding some hope and inspiration. We'll be examining what, it, what love is. So I think I'm still in process. Now that the film is starting to get out there in the world, I'm seeing how it's landing on people because I think, you know, Oprah Winfrey wanted to use this film as a, a device of healing. You know, how, how can we heal from our trauma? You know, she said, Color Purple has changed her life. That's the reason why her intention, her, Scott Sanders, you know, Quincy Jones, Steven Spielberg, the whole intention was to populate this with a, a fantastic director and great actors and, and craftsmen in every department and choreographers because they, it's so meaningful. It means the world to all of them that this, a film like this exists for people, for humanity. So it's like, you know, I don't know, it feels fantastic. I, I'm in the middle of it, so I don't really know but I know it feels real good. Yeah, it's touching the people it needs to touch and affecting the people it needs to affect. And uh, I also think to speak from the other side of it is that like I'm learning from watching and I'm learning how to uh, just what it what it's te taught me is how to be a better artist, right? Because I'm watching artists like Coleman um, not only advocate for his characters but also advocate for us as actors, mm -hmm. which I think is really important as black actors in Hollywood, um, within the studio system, um, watching Blitz fight for us and our choices and our nuance and our colors and our uh, ups and all of that stuff is, it matters. And, 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 and thank you for showing me how to be a leading man. Thank you for showing, for, sh for setting that, you know, example, um, because it's, 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 um, it, it, we just don't have we don't have that i mean we don't like an opportunity where you're on a set full of black excellence and um and i just i just think it needs to happen more i just think i think we need more examples of it and we have to lean into it when it when it's successful and uh but that's on us as well and again we have to be the example we have to set the example and and uh that that's how it's also changed me in addition to what he's saying other in other ways i'm still healing and feeling figuring it out mm -hmm. so you know 
Thank you both so much. You both did an excellent job. And you brothers can say thank you. Thank, thank you, man. And that's a wrap, folks. We've journeyed through the wild world of movies and TV from Lewis Pullman's thunderous entrance into the Thunderbolts to Jennifer Lopez's Bronx-inspired Bob the Builder Bonanza. Marvel's Fantastic Four might be getting a facelift and John David Washington might just conquer Kang like he was born to do. Plus, with The Last of Us Season 2 getting a directorial makeover, we're in for a roller coaster ride of emotions. So grab your popcorn, brace yourselves for the unexpected, and stay tuned for more movie madness coming your way. Until next time, stay witty, stay urban, and keep those corny jokes coming. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you all later. <laughs>